All right. Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Learning Tech Talks, where we are exploring the landscape of learning technology while cutting through the fluff and getting the questions answered you need answered as you walk into this new digital world. So today I am joined by Leslie Farinella, and she is the COO over at Xylem, and we are going to be talking about the mysterious LCMS or learning content management system. So I'm looking forward to this, but as we get started, uh, go ahead and, and like the post, share it, tag in somebody who may be trying to figure out what LCMSs are or would benefit from our conversation. And while we're getting going, also comment in and share with us where you are in the world today. So I will start with, well, I, I'll go first with this one because mine never changes. I'm always here in Waukesha, Wisconsin. The only thing that's exciting about it is the fact that it is gorgeous, despite the fact that it is early November where it was snowing last week. Now it's 70 something. So that's where I am. But how about you, Leslie? Where are you? I'm in Wilmington, North Carolina. So okay. nice right. and sunny so far. No hurricanes this season. So I was very <laughs> excited about that. I moved up from Florida a couple of years ago and got hit with two hurricanes. So I thought this okay. is crazy. But we've so been you like, moved so from Florida to North I've Carolina and, North and you got hit with hurricanes. Yeah, I would think it'd be the other way around. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. What what took you from? I am curious. What took you from Florida to North Carolina? Um, actually, I've decided. I found out we're called halfbacks. People who go north to south and come halfway back up. Um, the seasons. Just wanted a little bit more variety. So a little bit my more family in North Carolina. So the two together. Yep. I did not know there's a term for that. So yeah. half max. Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. And where was North? Where was North? Like North? Uh, Missouri. North? So actually we were more kind of towards Midwest North, but people go okay. cold and they go to Florida and then they okay. come back up a little bit. Apparently. So that's good to know. If my wife and I decide we want to move South, chances are we'll somewhere, we'll come back somewhere in the middle. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Well, so with that, then before we get into the discussion, let's move to our question that really has nothing to do with learning or learning technology. There might be a slight correlation between the two, but not, not too serious. All right, so with this one, and those of you watching, you're welcome to play along if you'd like in the comments. But Leslie, what is an activity you do regularly because you need to but it's not something you necessarily really enjoy doing. And, and if you could, you probably wouldn't. Well, interestingly, I didn't and now I must because of COVID and that's uh, cooking. So okay. restaurants went off a table. So I'm not a big cooker. Um, if anything, I would assemble. So I'd go to the store, get, you know, the rotisserie chicken, a couple cans of something, kind of assemble okay. it together. Or we'd get some takeout and I might add something else to it. But we ate out a lot. Okay. Um, like five days a week. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then COVID hit and I had to feed myself, my husband, and then my daughter was home from school. Um, so that was a challenge. But it's interesting how you learn through this stuff. I learned it's not so much the cooking I don't like. It was the having to decide what to cook because it's all this big conversation and then actually having those ingredients on hand. So I signed up for one of those, you know, where you get the cook in the bag where they oh, really yeah, 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 where they send you all the ingredients like blue, actually, blue ribbon. I don't know because you get on okay. the app, you pick your recipes, it comes in the mail on Monday, you unpackage it, you take the brown bag and the recipe card out of the refrigerator, and you follow the instructions. So okay. I'm deciding that's not so bad. Not so okay. Bad. Yeah. So so really, it wasn't the cooking part that you didn't like. It was more the uh, do I have the stuff? And oh, there's no cream and of mushroom soup. Make? I'm out of that seasoning, what? that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. So it, it includes everything, literally seasonings. And you just literally. Everything. The only thing you have to have is like butter and olive oil. But other than that, you get everything pretty much in the bag. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. All right. Well, see now I'm, yeah, I don't, I don't do any cooking. I, I toast, toast and scrambled eggs. I think that is the extent of my cooking culinary skills. But so it's kind of going back to though, you're kind of back to assemble mode, right? I am to assemble mode. Back to assemble yeah. mode. Yeah. Okay. And it gets That's down right. to kind of understanding like that need, like we're always trying to figure out what's that real need or what's that real problem you're trying to solve. 
So the problem wasn't the cooking, because I don't mind following the instructions. The problem was making the decision on what to cook and having the ingredients. What to cook and having it. Okay. Yeah. Well, Gwen Gwen shares this, right? She doesn't like grocery shopping. And honestly, but neither my wife and I, we we hate that, right? That, that's always the, oh, yeah. you get the right stuff. Going to the grocery store is a nightmare. So I, we haven't tried the, we haven't tried the, whatever they're called, right? The pre- yeah ready to go stuff. We do order all our stuff online. So that's just like, it shows up. Cause then we don't have to go to the girl. We have to try. Although we have five kids under the age of nine. Uh, well, that, that, may, that may, <laughs> all right, that may not work. I don't know. I mean, we'd have to order like six every day. I don't know that that would, I don't know that that would fly for us. Yeah. So. Well, my sister's a family of five and she does it. Okay. All right. All right. So they exist. Mike. Yeah. Okay. Well, well I'll, I'll let my wife know. We'll have to, we'll have to consider that. So mine, yeah. so mine is right. I, I regularly exercise. I, I do. I, that's kind of my thing. I've figured out what works, but honestly, if I could get away with not, if I could be like, Hey, I can stay healthy and fit and think about exercise and call it a day. I would not mind having that time back. Now, granted, I've, I've learned to enjoy it and I've learned that, yeah, it's, you know, it's kind of fun. It's a nice little break, but yeah, that's something that if I could just be like, nah, I don't need to, to stay healthy, I wouldn't, but whatever we you figured out that one. You could start a whole new industry with that. If I can, that's right. If I could come up with a, a you just, pill you or, just you know, that, there's money in that a chip that I could just, you just put in you and it magically worked your muscles. Uh, yeah, and, so. yeah, that's so. true. I wouldn't have to be in learning technology anymore. No, no, you'd be good. <laughs> that is funny. Okay. Well, Leslie, let's shift gears. Let's shift gears out of out of things we do that we don't necessarily care for and over into learning technology uh, in this space. So you're from Xylene, yes. which is an LCMS, but I'm curious before we get into what that is, what's what's your backstory? Like, how did you get into the space and into your role? Did you know you wanted to be a, a learning technology executive as a, as a young child? <laughs> People know it wasn't even on my radar. So I actually started out as a mechanical engineer. So really? I started out in manufacturing. Um, kind of got into training because I was doing training for operations and quality and lean. So started, okay. you know, really kind of getting the space. Then I got into leadership programs. So I was doing leadership programs for technology, quality, and operations. So I got okay. into that. Had my own consulting company with leadership programs, training, but also a little bit of business process improvement, which then became Lean that just became, you know, they they keep reinventing it. They've been named many different Yeah, it's got a bunch of different names. Yeah. The years. So software wasn't any on, nowhere on my radar at all. Um, <laughs> but we were solving a problem. It was actually a Six Sigma project and we were looking for a solution. And I said, you know what? Somebody has got to have technology that can help us here. But I had no idea what to call it. No idea. I was like Googling and asking around. And some one day I hit the Xylene website. I'm like, wow, somebody actually solved this problem. Um, so I we implemented it for that customer. It went really well. Then I ended up helping a couple of the Xylene customers as a consultant. And then the CEO of the time said, will you come on board and help with onboarding? So I became... Um, the VP of customer success and really helped the onboarding team. Um, but at that really said, you know, guys, we need to look at the market and, you know, the jobs to be done and what are people trying to really solve and ended up in the role I have now. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that is, well, and I always think it's interesting. I, I, you know, a lot of times I have these conversations and it's, it's fun hearing the, and we'll, we'll, the, my next question will tie into this one, but it's always fun hearing the stories of, I was trying to solve this problem and I couldn't, I, it was just, it was frustrating me. And then either people say, and so I went out and made it or they came across it and went, wow, here it is. I found it. So yeah. I, I think that, and that's where it leads to my next question. So what was this massive problem? What was this thing keeping you up at night, you know, banging your fist going, I wish something could do this, which gets us to the LCMS. Yeah, well, actually, it was around that there were a lot of content had overlap. And okay. so it already has the problem where something needs to change. And then you got to go find the 100 places it is. And then you spend six to nine months changing that. So the content that we had was pretty dynamic. And we were just in this constant maintenance mode. And basically, it was just overwhelming the team. It's said, guys, there's got to be a way to optimize this. right? We're just spending so much time 
on these updates and maintenance when we have this whole pile of stuff that would really move us forward and we're just being crushed by this maintenance. And we were like, and having come from, and I, you know, had done stuff with software. So I'd actually, I, I did skip, I was actually a software developer for one small period of time. Okay. until I spent like three months looking for a space and decided this is not for me. I mean, like, it's not <laughs> three hours. like I could do this, but this isn't you know, really where I want to be all the time. Three months to this bug and it was an extra speed. They said, oh, I don't like this job. <laughs> this is okay. no fun. Um, but anyway, um, I was like, you know what, you could put this in a database, right? Right? Couldn't you put some of this stuff in some sort of database and pull it together? It turns out Xylem had already figured that, yeah, you probably could. And there was actually a category around it called an LCMS or content management system specialized for learning. I think, you know, I found if you kind of put the learning, the bad people kind of get otherwise they start to see LMS and I, you know, what's funny is a you know, lot of times at the back. Yeah. It's Content management system. For I know. I know. I actually, <laughs> yeah, I get a lot of, uh, I talk to a lot of people about it. And when they're looking for an LCMS, they it's even hard sometimes to Google it. Because if you yep. search LCMS, you get LMS, you get a learning management system. Mm -hmm. And that isn't what an LCMS is. And I think that's an important distinction to make is the LMS is managing the the learner facing stuff, right? That stuff on the front end that's being distributed and being pushed out, but it's, it's not, it's not managing the back end. And I think that's the part that you're getting at all these, all these objects, all these assets, all these different things that we use in our content that get thrown on share points. They get stuffed on external jump drives. They get put all over the place. One example I think of that I'm sure has a lot of people tearing their hair out right now is this whole death of Flash. Oh, I can't yeah. how many emails I'm getting about, right? Don't forget, Flash is dead this year and all this stuff. And the number of conversations where people are scrambling, going, we yeah. need to think, does anybody know where this was? You're like, nope, it's gone. If you create a database, you would know all the places that you have it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that was the problem. It was really, you know, this idea of how do you wrangle this content together? And I think what Xylene came to is that, you know, why do we lock our content into these formats up front? You know, yeah. why isn't content just content? Um, you know, to me, content's like a great explanation or it's that um, discussion driving question or it's those activities that you provide. That's the content that adds value. Um, yeah. We tend to, though, mix it with the layout and we say, you know, the content is that plus the layout. But if you separate those two, you get a lot of power because now I can store the content separate from that yeah. output or layout. And now it can become whatever you want it to be later. So it could become a print brochure, it become a job aid, it could become an e-learning, or it could go to a chat bot or to augmented reality You can do whatever you want with the content. So that's, you know, kind of at the core of what we do is unlocking that content. I kind of think of it as maybe like an ERP for learning because you author it, you unlock it, and then you can publish it into multiple channels, multiple outputs. Um, distribute it in many different ways. So that could be to score them to the LMS, but also to a learning portal or links or just whatever yeah. you can dream up, right? Because it's very flexible. And then we can measure it. So we can then track all those different places it is. So it's kind of, it does that whole cycle. To me. Well, and I think what's, what's interesting about that, and it is a really important point with this, because it's a shift to your point. It's a shift in a lot of the operational processes that a lot of learning functions have in place, right? It's, it's a very important shift in that because a lot of times, and I think of it as I look at the content or the things we produce as their stories. It's telling a story. But the problem is a lot of times, like you said, we package all the elements of the story together into that story. And then we put it in there and it's trapped in that story. And sometimes the story changes, or sometimes you only need to tell part of the story, yep. But now that story is packed in this cement block <laughs> and you can't really get to it. So the only way you do anything with it is to actually either recreate the story or try and bust this thing apart. But it becomes extremely difficult versus if you change your operating procedures to say, let's keep these story elements organized back here so that we can repurpose these story elements in whatever story we're trying to tell. It's huge. I remember I was running an organization years ago and we were working with a vendor and 
we, we'd receive some of the, the final content that we were going to use. And I asked for all of the source assets. I said, can you send us all the source assets as well so that we can repurpose and we can put those in our, at the time, LCMS. And the vendor told me that's the first time they'd ever been asked for the source assets. Nobody had ever asked them for that stuff to be able to repurpose. And we had to figure out how are they going to transfer it and all this stuff. But it's an important thing, but it is a big shift. It is. It is huge. I think that somewhere along the way, and I think part of it is, you know, the rapid authoring tools and the WYSIWYG tools that came about. So we like to say what you see is what you get is all you'll ever get. You know, you're never going to get anything out out of it. And a lot of the tools have gone that direction. And there's value to that, right? It is fast. It is quick. It is, you know, easy. Um, But If your content has a lot of business value, if it has overlap, if it's very dynamic content, it also then you're going to create this maintenance load. So and then I think personalization just made it worse. See, that's the thing that what's really driving people towards the LCMS now is the fact that they don't just do ILT or they don't just do learning and they've gone to blended. But now, you know, what people rightfully so think of learning has greatly expanded, right? Learning could be a checklist. Learning could be a discussion guide. Learning could be, um, you know, it could be micro. It could be a big course. If somebody, you know, is novice, they got to learn a lot of stuff. It can, and now we're looking at chatbots and augmented reality. And with all of that, if you start to create all of those different versions without any type of um, reuse or linking of common elements across those, the maintenance will crush you. And that's when people come to us because they realize that they're just spending so much time on the maintenance that it's not efficient. And it's really moving to a handcrafted world to a mass customization world. And when you start thinking about mass customization, you can still have all this varieties, but you can do it so much more efficiently. And um, I think marketing actually has figured this out pretty well. And learning can learn from what marketing has done. They do. Marketing has gone through this journey. I I have a fair amount of friends over in the marketing space and and they have, theirs are called DAMs, the the data asset management systems, right? They have their own kind of version of this for that very reason, because again, the inefficiency, which your background in lean (laughs) and process improvement, it makes sense. You would be the COO of an LCMS, just so you know, that makes, that makes perfect sense because it very much is a process improvement and efficiency. How do you use more from what you have instead of, I think in many regards, it is interesting your point about what happened in 2020 really did drive a greater demand for this because we maybe gotten a little comfortable in, ah, we'll just recreate it from scratch. It's not that big a deal. There's not that much variety, things like that. But now not only has this mass customization and personalization come, but in my opinion, the need for speed is Mm -hmm. at an all-time high the ability to do things and again not that we just throw things out the door but this whole idea of well we're just going to start over and go through this whole thing and and recreate everything we we really can't anymore it's it's just unacceptable we never should have but really now i feel like the pressure is on to not that is true that is true I think the other thing, you know, that kind of came about too was the idea of in the flow of work, right? So that, you know, we want to start to embed content into other things. So, but if my content is trapped in, you know, an e-learning module or a scoring package or, you know, some of the other things we trapped to do, how can I possibly start to embed it in other applications? But if your content is in XML, like a technical, you know, if it's flexible, yeah. I can stream, I can embed that content into Salesforce. I can embed it to into your CRM system, your ERP system. I can um, do lots more things with that content. So to me, that's that second driver that's really pushing um, towards an LCMS. Yeah. Well, and the other thing on that, because it is, it's a really good point. And and again, this is a very fundamental shift in the way you think about design and ops. You Mm -hmm. really have to think like an operator to really understand and maximize the value of this, to think of what we're doing as the learning supply chain and saying, hey, how do we actually move things further up the supply chain? Because again, the other thing that I see from a technical standpoint that I think sometimes limits organizations is when you lock all these assets into a specific 
tool or platform, and that's the only place they exist, it becomes very difficult to shift if you need to. If you want to start using a different platform or you want to change technologies, you almost have now handcuffed yourself because, well, if we're going to make this shift, we almost have to start back from ground zero on absolutely everything versus if you've backed this up and you've said, well, we have all the story elements and they're not trapped over here. You don't have to break apart that cinder block and then grab the elements. You just say, well, it's fine. We just shift gears. And again, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with being attached or using a certain tool, mm -hmm. but that flexibility and that ability to adjust and pivot just goes back to the agility. I think we need to incorporate more in the work we do. You're right. And I think the other thing that's happened is the tools, our distribution points also increasing, right? So it used to be pretty much the LMS, right? We were forcing people the LMS. We realized that's not the way to go. We tried to build these learning portals as our one-stop shop. Everybody would come there. And now we have the learning experience platforms. But what I really think is you need to put the content where the learner is. Let them trip over it wherever that may be and stop trying to push people to one place. Let them go everywhere. But again, then we get into this, how do I keep things in sync? How do I think people's up to date? But what if your content was in a central repository and all you're putting in all those places is just a pointer back yep. to that single source? And then if I update the content, and what I literally mean is I update a pair block, a pair block, or I update a table in that content, it propagates that change everywhere that content is. So yeah. I don't have to go find it. In fact, I don't even have to know where it is. Now, I probably want to know because I want to measure probably the distribution. Good. Probably good, yeah. And we do that too, right? So we do measure the distribution. We know where people are coming from. But I don't have to do that. I just know everywhere that is, I'm going to push out that change which technology has been doing in code all the time, right? Yeah. You do hot fix code all the time. So it's like hot fixing your content. You just take this <laughs> Can you imagine if software after. companies had to send you a floppy disk still to every person? I, well, that's that a good had, point. That's kind of what we're it, doing. That's right. In many ways, yeah. that's kind of how we've run as learning yeah. and development. We're like, oh, well, yeah. we made an update to this PDF. Yeah. I guess we've got to go drop ship this to the 8,000 um, different locations and make sure it's not sitting on anybody's hard drive yeah. because it's out of date. Well, you laugh, but you're, we're still downloading these big SCORM packages, which are way too big anyway. They shouldn't be that big, you know, because that means you've got this huge mammoth course. But we're downloading these huge packages and we're uploading again over and over again. So through a learning content management system, what we do is we, again, put a pointer in the LMS. So you only have to put that pointer there once. It's a couple of kilobytes. It's easy. You can email it to somebody. Um, and then all the updates are pushed after that. You don't have to download and upload these files. So we have some, I'm sure there's some in the audience that have multiple LMSs. You know, one customer that their goal is to get, I think, from 20 to three. They're really excited to get to three LMSs. Let's just say I'm very familiar. I'm very familiar with that challenge. Yeah. So, yeah it, yeah, it exists in the in the world. Oh, it does. It does. And it's <laughs> in a lot of them. them. Right. They only have to update it in one place. It updates all the LMSs, right? You only update it once. All the LMSs get updated everywhere you put that content. So it really is around, you know, keeping stuff in sync and keeping up. Um, you know, because you need the consistency because learners yeah. get frustrated when they read one version here and there's another version here and we're trying to keep everything um, aligned. And so, you know, you can you can do it that way. But the other piece to that is, you know, link, don't copy. So we reuse content now. People have been doing it forever. Copy, paste, copy, paste. I mean, I do it all day long. The problem with copy, paste is that uh, in my PowerPoint decks, we all have those like take yeah. these slides and take this one and put it in. But the problem with that is when you have to go to update it again, right? I've got to go find all the places. If I had linked, not copied that piece of content, um, and all that sounds great, there are some challenges. So the one challenge to the link, not copy, is you have to have the discipline to actually link. That is, and a lot of people yeah. said, well, but mine's different, right? I need a different color. <laughs> always the I exception. need a different table or I'm special. Yeah. And also, there are cases when it's true. So that is true. But I think there is some discipline to sit back and say, do we really need it? So one of our customers had 14 versions of how to wash your hands. They were healthcare <laughs> Um, interestingly, they That's got down a lot to of variety. If you think about it, you need to still need two, but I got down to two. So that was down to two versions yeah, yeah. of how to wash. Two versions. I love this. couldn't get any further. But the good news is that, you know, once you standardized on that and that was still a good exercise for them. Yeah. So there was even value in them getting down to a consistent. These are the two best versions of the content. 
So one of the paradoxes in Val Swisher content rules, she's coming out with a book on this, um, the, uh, the personalization paradox is that you have to standardize to personalize, right? You're not gonna be able to really do personalization at any type of scale if you don't first standardize on some blocks. So think of Lego blocks. Yep. I've got to have some things because most of the content, the, if we think about it, you were right about the storytelling. So what should be the same and different? So what's the same is the concepts. Well, once yeah. the, the top level is why is the business doing this? So the business driver is pretty much the same. The concepts are the same. The procedural steps are absolutely the same. Um, what's different is why does it matter to me in my role or what yeah. might be different for me by my region or or if am I a novice or an expert? So experts want to skim the stuff. Novices mean you to take them through it in a little bit more detail. Those are different, but there's a lot of overlap there that can be linked between the different ones. And there's huge efficiency when you start to do that. Well, and massive efficiencies in that, because the example that comes to mind as you were talking about this, right? I, I think the 15 washing hands courses just cracks me up. But if you think about it, let's just, let's just use that as an example. And, and I've seen this happen. I, I've probably been guilty of it myself, right? Is the fact that you will create these 15 different versions where really, even within those 15, there are mutual story elements that are not any different. You're, you're simply tailoring the story in different ways. But to your point, this becomes a logistical and maintenance nightmare as you now are thinking, oh, wait, this one element changed which one of the fifth, which one was it in? We need to go back and make sure that we fix this one. Oh, we missed this one. Now we got to republish all 15 of these things. We've got to distribute these across our three LMSs to make sure that we have the right versions. And it, it becomes an impossible task, which to me, I, I see where this has grown and where, where sometimes maybe we don't even see it as a problem. I think of the frog in the boiling water analogy mm -hmm. where we've just, gotten used to this, we don't realize the sheer magnitude of inefficiency and waste that we've baked into our processes that if we could lean Six Sigma that out, we would free ourselves up tremendously to do either create more content, spend more time personalizing it, do a better job of integrating it into the flow of work, things like that, time that is going to make a big impact versus making sure we've published the right version and we've cleaned up our mess across our ecosystem. Absolutely. I think status quo, when I people ask me who's my big, biggest competitor, I say it's the status quo. <laughs> You know, it is because it is it is a shift. It is a shift in operations, as you said. It changes the flow of work in the groups that changes, you know, responsibilities and roles. We're used to WYSIWYG. It's amazing how much we're used to the layout and how much designers really um, part of their psyche of design is attached to how things look and lay out on a page. Yeah. Um, but once they get used to it, they realize it's freedom up, you know, how they, that they don't miss the fussing with the margins and the, and the, you know, spacing and the color. And so there's just efficiency in getting rid of that because the technology puts, you know, all of that in. Um, anybody here who does the QA on branding standards would love this because <laughs> you can't change it, right? If you decide the branding standard is 12 point font blue, the technology is going to put 12 point font blue. No, but no human can change that is that's what's going to be, um, which can frustrate people because we're all used yeah. to having, you know, you have the PowerPoint deck slide master, you know, you're supposed to follow oh, and no. follows it as yeah, kind of that. But it's the status quo is it's really, you know, thinking about it in a different way. And, you know, starting to realize that the pain that I have to your boiling pot doesn't have to be I can I can actually solve this. Yeah, the pain we've accepted and just yeah. accepted as reality doesn't have to be a pain. It actually you can you can reduce or all eliminate it if you really. But again, going back to your point, it is a discipline. It is a yeah. discipline that you have to follow. And I've seen many organizations and have been part of them where you kick off with kind of this half effort, like, well, we'll try it or we'll see. And we don't really adhere to it. And it does. It does create, it can create more chaos or just become that. The question I have for you, though, I'm curious how organizations deal with this. Because that, and, I, and I've worked through this with my teams before, is this, there is, going back to this creative point, sometimes it can feel like it's stomping on your creativity a little bit. 
you know, your, oh, your yeah, box in, your not yeah. a little bit, a lot. And I've, and I've had to have these conversations on more than one occasion yeah. where it, it feels unfair because now I can't, I can't just paint on the blank canvas. I can't just let my creativity flow. I've got a perspective, but I'm curious how you've seen clients navigate that because it is real. And it is something that if you're considering doing this, you have to be ready to have that conversation you because you will get that pushback. You will get that pushback of, oh, now all our stuff is all going to look the same and it's, it's going to yeah. be boring and it's going to be blah and it, my creativity is going to be stifled. Uh, I hear that. I hear that. You know, I find that different people gravitate to different types of creativity, kind of back to my cooking. It wasn't really the cooking. Yeah was the stuff. So some people find creativity in the writing of the content, creating the story, making it relevant to the person, coming up with those questions that are really going to drive discussion. And that you, you, you just, that's the text. The other people, you know, their creativity was in the graphics and how it would look, but you still have to design the templates, right? You still have to design the look and feel for the different experiences. You're just not doing them at the same time. So those people tend to gravitate more into the template design and outputs, you know, design, which is really just, you know, how it's going to lay out the page, what's the colors, the spacing. It is consistent, but you can have multiple outputs for different yeah. jobs. And we say, don't pick another output just so that it's different. Align it with jobs that people need to do, right? Is it performance support? Is it a micro learning? Is it a part of a bigger curriculum or course that you're taking to people through for some sort of certification? Or, you know, you want it to all kind of look together. You might even brand it for different divisions. Um, or if you have, you know, different franchises, you can brand it over that. So, you know, there's a lot to thinking about that and thinking about then from the learner's perspective, right? Look at the layout design, which I don't know that you do when you're doing the content together. Like yep. if I'm doing it for performance and sports, skimmability is my number one thing, right? I want people to be able to skim it. And if we think about that consistency, it should be at the top of your list, right? You don't want you don't want people to have to learn the new navigation scheme every time they want to go skim a document. They do once they get it, then the next time they know, oh, I always know this is at the bottom, or I always know this is on the left of the third page, or whatever, so they can get to it as quick as they can. And then the third part of the the creative equation tends to be the learner experience. So how is the learner going to interact with the content? Are they you know, riding home on the bus? Are they, you know, at home at work? Are they doing it between calls and a call center? Are they out in the field? Are they a salesperson sitting in the parking lot? So that person is thinking about what's the experience? So then what are the output types that I need? And what would be the optimal design of that output type for that particular job that the content needs to do? And then you can pull in the content relevant to that, which is just text and pictures and words. Um, to make that all come together. So you really start to break the creativity into these three different um, roles. And sometimes yeah. they're literally different people. Sometimes it could be the same people, you know, different hats depending on the side of your organization, but it does tend to tease out into those three. Okay. Groups. Interesting. Well, that's, and it very much aligns. So I'll, I'll share kind of my background with this and how I've tackled it. One of the ones you hit on it, and I think this is one of the biggest, it can be a difficult conversation to have, which is, who are we really here to serve ourselves or the learners? Because if you're putting your own, like I want it this way and I want to be able, well, then you're putting yourself above really the needs of the employees. And if we're saying we're a learner centric organization, then that should be our top priority. Our top priority should not be, well, I want how I want it. Our top priority should be what is the best way to do this for employees and learners. And I think once you reset that perspective, and again, that's a tough conversation to have because you have to really address that head on and say, who are we, who are we here for? It's not for us. And granted, that doesn't mean you can't use your gifts and your skills to the best of your ability to serve that, but they have to come first. And I think once you reset that, going back to the mindset shift we talked about, that's a that's a tremendous repositioning of the way you're looking at things. And I think from there. I love the point you bring up is, well, then break down where is that creativity still applied and what this this to me shifts back to the whole movement that I'm seeing now in the industry, which is we're moving away from roles to mm -hmm. skills. We're moving to this. Well, 
what skills really get you up at night? Like, what are the skills that, that make you tick, that make you do that? And then we can reframe, well, where can we help you put those skills to use? Is it in design, true graphic design and these elements? We still need them. We still yeah. need them. We just, what we don't want to do is be recreating and doing them every single time and doing them 15 times over. Yep. Is it in the writing? Is it in this other piece? Where do you want to apply that creativity? And to me, the beauty of this type of technology is we can now free you up to do this at greater scale so that you can impact more employees and learners. Isn't that really what we want to do anyway? Isn't that what we want to do is say, I don't want to just do this for one course. I want to do this for 50 courses. I want to reach 10,000 employees, not 100 and that's the goal of this is saying, now you can take that creativity, apply it at a scale where you're still getting the benefit, but ultimately we're certain. And I think that's a, it's a great way to approach it. But again, it, it take, it does take that intentional reframing or it just won't click. That's true. It is mass customization, but even in mass customization, you get variety, right? Not everything has to look the same but align it for a reason, right? Based on the job that that content needs to do, the learner experience, as you were saying. And I think that if we asked our learners, if the fact that all of our custom, our stuff looks the same and is boring, they'd probably be like, what? Boring? I don't care. I need to do my job, right? I, it did what I needed it to do. I didn't really, you know, decide that because, you know, um, I've looked at all these performance support documents, they all looked at the same. I was actually good because I, you know, knew where to go in the content. And even in the courses, having the same navigation structure, having the same thing, it's just cohesive looking fear. The human brain actually likes that. Yeah. Um, and I think it's boring to your point. It might be boring to us as the creator because we're just doing the, you know, it seems like we're just doing the same thing. But I don't know that I've ever seen on a learner survey. Well, this was boring. It looked just like the other five courses. <laughs> I really wish that I had to learn the navigation over every time exactly. I did the course. That, that is the number one thing that comes back on my NPS scores. I can tell you that. People just say, I really wish I had to relearn this every time. Exactly. But, but going back to your point, I think this is where you can still apply that creativity. Yeah. It doesn't, it's, it's again, it's, it's your mindset. Are you looking at it as, oh, I'm being boxed in? Or are you looking at it as, well, now I can actually perfect. I have more time and energy to perfect that experience. I can still make it look incredible. Oh yeah. But I'm going to make it look incredible in a consistent way so that people aren't tripped and hung up on how do I use this thing? And they're just, because honestly, then they're not appreciating the simplicity mm -hmm. or the look of it because they're too busy trying to figure out where the heck is this stuff? I can't find what I need out of this thing. Yeah. In fact, you have infinite flexibility on your outputs. I mean, it's HTML, it's CSS, and it's JavaScript. I mean, you can do whatever you want with it. The question we always push back on customers sometimes is, do you really need to, right? You don't want to make things overly complicated to the learner, to your point, but to me, if I can really think about, okay, my job is I've got a sales guy. He's pulled into the parking lot post COVID. He's pulled into the parking lot and he's going into next job and he wants to review the product specs and the customer stuff before he walks in one more time. And he, so he's going to sit there on his phone or on his tablet and he wants to get to that. So what is the experience that I need? It's probably going to be a really simple page, right? You, you're going to make it, you want to search for it quickly to be able to find it. He probably, if it's if it's laid out the same, he can get to here are the benefits or here's the you know the pricing structure. He knows exactly where to find whatever he needs to find real quickly. Or he's in the job, they've asked him a question, they're taking a break. Again, he's pulling it out real quick. I want to go figure out what I need to know right now. That's really a very different experience than I'm onboarding somebody to a new job, right? So their yeah. experience is different. I've got, you know, I got to give them more context. I want them to feel welcome to the company. I want them to get a sense of our culture. I want, you know, to really understand, you know, how this fits into the bigger picture, their role. So that's a very different experience, but a lot could be a lot of the same content because they need to know about the product too and the product values and benefits. Yeah. So you've got an overlap of content, but the experiences are very different and you can do that now. And to me, spending more time on that and what it needs to look like as opposed to locking it into these other, you know, one time use throwaway is, is much more valuable. 
It, it, it absolutely is. And I think as you're, as you're thinking about it, as you were talking about that situation, the one thing that I reflect back to and continue to reflect on, you know, with teams is I can't ever think of a situation where my teams have said, you know what we've personalized for every situation and every, every employee learner experience, we've yeah. thought of them all and we've designed for all of them. And I think going back to that, not feeling confined or everything's going to look the same. No, actually not. Going back to one of the comments that came in, now you can actually spend the time to think, what are all the different situations? What are the different, you know, unique differences within things where it does make sense to say, hey, we could differentiate this so that it was very clear that this is this is aligned to this type of business unit or this is aligned to this type of situation and we can design that way to make it easier. But historically, because of the sheer volume of waste that we often are stuck with, we don't have time to do that. It's why a lot of times we end up saying, well, we, you know, we, we made this one, it's going to have to work for everybody because we don't really have time to create different versions for different people because it would just become a mass. Well, then the maintenance. So that's right. the, so this is where people get stuck. So personalize and do what we said. Let's think about all the jobs and the experiences and how people need to consume the content within their role. And so let's say we, we map that out. And for this one piece, we end up with 10. That's great. We create those 10 until we have to update it and update it again and update it again and update it again. That's the problem. Yep. So if I link, don't copy then not to say that you never have to update it, but if I link, don't copy, I can update it once and it's gonna update every place that content's used. But if we think about what changes the most, so we said the part that I probably customize is the story, right? Yeah. How does this apply to your role? Um, the business direction, which some of that could be reused or linked, and um, that stuff doesn't change as often as perhaps the procedure or the specific. So actually what we found is the part that's the same tends to change more than the part that's that story that's different. That tends to have a longer lifetime. Um, and then, and if that changes, it doesn't always change for all the roles at once. And you don't have to go find the 10 different places. You already know it's in this one place because this is the field service version, right? This is the sales version. Yeah. So you know where to go and you're going to change it in that one place for that group. And then you don't end up with the inconsistency because that's the other thing is, you know, trying to keep all of these versions in sync so that everybody's on the same page. Yeah. Well, it, 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 it's, it's, it just brings me back to a lot of different situations. And I think the one thing that I would say, and you'd probably say it right alongside me is you can't underestimate, you can't underestimate that this is, making this shift is not, it's not an easy, you don't just flick a light switch and go, Hey, there, we did it. Now it's all, it's, it's hard. It's work. And to me, where I've seen these things go South is People just don't stick to the commitment of getting through the tough part. It does get easier. It gets easier over time as you start to, you know, build this. Going back to my, you know, what I what I do that I don't necessarily. When you first start working out, you're not like this is amazing. I'm sore all the time, and I'm not feeling great, and this is uncomfortable. Boy, I want to keep doing this moving forward. But as you get through it, it becomes a natural routine. It becomes that, and you start to realize, wow. I, I feel better. I'm moving quicker. I'm right. All these other things, but you have to be willing to get through that pain to actually realize the benefit. That's true. And so we figured that out at Xylem. So basically our onboarding team helps. We're your personal trainer. So we found, you know, we have to provide. <laughs> we're keeping this analogy going. Yeah, to keep them through this. And we've also figured out, and the, the, the good news is that the software is flexible, so you can change your mind over time. So you can start small and grow. So while you have this ultimate vision of what you want to do, nobody can start with that, right? You can't boil the ocean. So, But it's better to start the journey than to never start. So start small. You can evolve over time. Um, definitely our team's job is to keep, you know, we're your cheerleaders, we're coach, we'll push, we'll pull, we'll, we'll help you along, um, as you go, but we'll just take it step by step and bit by bit, um, because it can feel daunting at time, but we've figured yeah. out how to, to break that up. So it's not so, so daunting. Well, that, that's extremely helpful to add that point because I feel like you see this happen. It looks yep. so overwhelming when you're looking at all the way down the road and you're going, we just can't do it. And then you don't even take a step forward versus saying, okay, yeah, that, that feels like a lot, but this, this first step, 
we yeah. can do that, right? We can do that. That's, that's, we can make that step and then you make another step and then you make another step. And over time you start to make these step changes that lead to behavior. Change. This is the basic it science the basic behind how you get people to change team. behaviors and learn. Yeah. Start with one team. I say, start with your blank people, piece of paper people, right? Find a team of your people who love a blank piece of paper and they want to just reimagine us. I've seen the best scenario is start with a team of five of those people and get them started. Pick pick one vertical or one curriculum or one target audience like sales or whatever. Just pick one piece with that group and they will get energized and they'll figure it out. And then they'll bring in another group and then they'll bring in another group and they'll bring in another group. And then you'll evolve as you go, right? So things will change, you'll learn lessons, but you know, we can we can adapt as we go. Um, the good news is it's not like you can figure it once and you can't change the setting. <laughs> That's pretty easy. I, I tell people, you know, actually turn it on the software is easy. I can set the software up for you in two days. That's not the problem. It's the business process. That's where you've got, you know, to shift the mindset, how, you know, the authoring, the roles, the business process, that's the part that takes a little longer. So if you start small and prove it out with a team and then they have something to show the business, right? Then they can show the ROI. They can show what they did. They can, they can show, wow, you guys did five things. Look, we did 50. <laughs> Isn't this great? Look what we're doing over here. But then people are like, whoa, how did you do that? And then people get excited and they want to see and they'll follow. So as you know, you've probably seen um, one of my favorite TED Talks, the first follow follower. So, you know, I get that group yeah. and then the first follower and then you get the rest along. And then, you know, next thing you know, you've got a hundred. So we've had, you know, started with five and now they got, you know, a hundred off of four, you know, four or five different business units across. So, I love yeah. that. And it's an important, I, I love the example you gave of how to do this because I can tell you we've, we, and this is the beauty and the challenge of L and D is the diversity of personalities that you have in the space, they're, they're all over. You've got your you know, left brain thinkers, you got your right brain thinkers, you got people kind of right in the middle of the mix. And I can tell you it coming from one of the, you know, very left brain thinkers of very process, you know, your lean six Sigma person on the team, your project manager, going to one of the creatives and saying, no, you're actually really going to like this. We're going to standardize this. And, and believe me, it's going to be great not a super great change management approach. They're not necessarily going, wow, the project manager thinks it's great. You know, they love spreadsheets and Gantt charts. Yeah. I bet they understand what I deal with and in the creative side. But if you can find, like you said, those, those creative team members who are willing to give it a shot and say, just try it, right? Let's try it. Let's show what we can do. They become your change champions and they can be the ones that then say, hey, I get it. It sounds like jumping into this pool is going to squeeze all your creativity out and you're going to be shackled to boring stuff, but it's not in fact. Right. And, and they do, they advocate for it because once you see it and once you experience it, you do go, Whoa, this is, this is much better. This is much better and much more efficient. And now I have, have this capability. The question I have for you, and I'm curious on this one, um, you know, in terms of, as you've worked with organizations, you hit on it a little bit, but I'm curious if you can go deeper on this is, you know, when it comes to securing budget for things, right? Some things are definitely easier to secure budget for than others. Because if you're saying, hey, we've got this new front end learner platform, it's going to learning in the flow of work, transformative experience, skill based learn, right? Business leaders kind of, yeah, all right, cool. That sounds very exciting and, and neat. And I can understand, I can connect the dots to how this is going to help me. When you go to them and say, hey, we've got this really amazing platform that's going to clean up our internal processes and reduced waste, doesn't always have, depending again who you're talking to, yeah. but doesn't necessarily have this, yeah, where, where do I sign? Like, how much do you need? That kind of attitude. So how, how do organizations then help build that case for this is something we need and, and this is how we plan on using it. And this is why I get you may think or have a hard time connecting to how this benefits you, but here's, here's how it does. Yep. Um, yeah, we're plumbing, you know, plumbing isn't always like the, <laughs> you know, the, the sexiest thing on the planet, but you know what? People want the water to run and they want the lights to come on. And 
if you're talking about scale, uh, most people, unfortunately, they wait till the pain is so high that they almost don't have a choice. But at that point, you know, you're scrambling and you're really in pain. So it would be nice if people would start sooner than that. Okay. Um, so it's kind of an easier case. I have found actually that the managers get it pretty quick because the ROI as far as efficiency is a pretty, you know, if you map it out, you know, here's, here's the content, you know, we, we, rec you know, we can help you look at your and talk about your content, how much reuse you have, but usually it's 30 to 50%. So you have that, you know, right now we're only able to provide three flavors. If we could, you know, personalize it to these 10 groups, then we would, you know, be able to get quicker access to information when they're sitting in the parking lot. You tell them the stories of, you know, what you could do. Um, and then the distribution side, you know, keeping everything in sync and consistent. So, you know, a lot of that, you know, most leaders get that pretty quick. Um, I found the higher up in the organization, the quicker they get it. I think that the challenge I've always found, the person that's the hardest to sell is the managers of the design teams. It's the, okay. because they're like, well, we're gonna lose productivity while we start true, right? It's, I'm gonna have to change roles. Do I have the right skill set? Well, we'll see, you know, there may be some shifting in roles here. Um, and what's my content gonna look like? You know, cause it's this, you know, kind of ambiguous and you can show them some samples, yeah. But I don't know. And, and I'm going to have to change the way we think about our workflow. So there's just a lot of anxiety and angst. Okay. And that, that is the group that's impacted the most with the change. So that, that's all sure. fair. The other king indicator I've had, and when I implemented this before coming to Xylem, one of the keys to success was, is your L&D group order takers or are they learning consultants? Because if they're order takers, trying to get to a standardized output is really hard. Because yeah. people are telling you, this is what I want. If you're learning consultants already and you're consulting back to the business, you know, based on adult learning theory and based on what we're doing, this is what I recommend. Here's how it looks. And that group is going to stay with it um, and accept, you know, this standard, then you're good. But if the groups you go to, they're like, well, no, I think that should be purple or really I want that. You know, and we know there's a lot of that going on. Yeah, right? And it happens. It's not, it has nothing to do with retention. We know it has nothing to do with learning, but if that group is driving the design, if the business is driving the design, it gets tough. So that's the other place where you have okay. to have some change with the stakeholders based on what they're used to being able to drive in the design phase. That's a, I, I'm really glad, I, I'm glad I had time to ask that question and get into this because it is a really important piece. And it's some things that, again, to think about from this standpoint, because one, I think about it to your point, the senior leaders, to me, this type of tech is actually one of the easiest to sell because in terms of quantifying the ROI in business speak, you can do it real quick. Yeah. Right, you start tabulating efficiency and waste and how much time is spent on this. You can come up with some pretty big numbers and say, this is how much money we're spending over here with all this other stuff. This is how much we would save by doing that or how much more we could do if we could squeeze this much more thorough put out of the work that we're doing. And they, oh, okay, sounds good. That makes sense, right? There's a justifiable ROI behind it. But to your point, the people who really are affected by it that's it's a big shift for them. And again, the success of its implementation and its utilization is very heavily reliant on them. And I think that is in over the years where I've seen that go south is if they refuse, right, or they're just like, we're not doing it, it, it doesn't work. And so I think from a change management standpoint, that is something that learning leaders need to refocus this idea that, well, we'll just make them. Yeah, that's the truth. In fact, we will send people away if we see that happen, quite honestly. We we won't sell it. We don't think you're ready. And we'll tell you what you need to get ready. But one of the things we look for is a really strong champion who we feel could really energize and motivate the group. And then if they're willing to go back to finding those three or four or five people who want to reimagine the process, who like a blank piece of paper and start with them, because they're, they can then sell it to their peers better than management can just say, we're all going to do this. So they start to prove it out. People like to see examples, see it in action. You know, they can, it, yeah. it becomes more tangible at that, at that point. So that really works best. Um, 
if it's just, you know, a do this or get out, that's <laughs> never going to work. It, does, it doesn't. This is not a stroke of the pen. This is not a stroke of the pen. No, type thing no, where you no. Go, well, I it said, everyone, you're going to use this. So it'll work. And it's going to be so painful for both sides, which is why we we tend not to sign those deals. We've just found, you know, because, you know, we are committed to making our customers successful. So we put our hearts and souls into it. And it's just too draining when we just know it's a losing battle. So we try not <laughs> to even get into it. We're like, you know what? We just don't see that you can be successful yet. Here's what we recommend. You yeah. know, let's work with you to get there. And we have some consultants and partners that we can send people to to kind of just think about what they want to do and get that more in line and then come back to us. Because, again, the technology is just the enabler to the dream, right? Yep. You, you've got to have the the dream has to be at least somewhat baked before you, you want to start with the technology because a lot of it is the people in the process and yeah. what you're trying to do. Well, and it goes back to that order taker piece as well, yeah. right? And that's a shift. That's a shift you should be making, whether anyway. you're whether you're considering doing an LCMS or not. Because realistically, it's again, who is the most important person for us to focus on? It's the learner and the employee, not not Mr. Stakeholder or Mrs. Stakeholder who thinks that I I like purple, make it purple. Mm, that's not adding value. That's not no. That has nothing to do with the impact of what we're trying to achieve. And it goes back to that outcome mindset first of saying, well, what are we trying to achieve? How is that? Is that adding to that? No, it's not. Well, then let's not worry about that. So one question, because I, I knew we were going to run out of time. We could just keep going. But one question that came up um, from Mar Marisha is, do is there collaboration and communication between the learners? And I think I know the answer to that. But you know, in terms of the L and D people who are in here creating these assets, managing these assets, how are they? How are they collaborating? Are they collaborating in the tool? Or are they doing that outside the tool? How does that work? So as far as the designers, it is in the cloud and they can collaborate. We don't have an in chat, but you can check in, check out different pieces. So you can definitely use an agile approach where different people are working in the same thing, which with a lot of the desktop tools, you really can't. But most people are working to the dev tools. Um, do have a review session function. So you can send that out. You know, forget those emails. How painful was that? Wow. Send it out. Delete everything. With. So it's all in the interface. It collects all the comments together. One reviewer can see the other reviewer's comments. And you can go through and, you know, say, yes, we're doing one, two, three. No, we're not doing that. That's silly. And, you know, put your comments as to why and track all that. Okay. Um, uh, by the way, auditors love our system because we, oh, know, I bet they do. we know every paragraph, who updated every paragraph, every picture, everything. You know exactly who updated it, what date they updated. When, yeah, I have to imagine for highly regulated industries, this oh, has yeah. to be a you know, yeah. healthcare, right? Healthcare, Things like that. airlines, you know, oil and gas. Military, any, yeah. Any yeah they love us because we have full version control. We know exactly what version everybody saw. Um, we have question level analytics, all that. But anyway, I digress from, from your question. As far as learn a collaboration, no, because again, we're feeding it to your other systems, right? So we're going to feed yeah. the content to the LMS, to your learning experience platform, to you can embed it into to your chat or Yammer or whatever, your Zendesk. So we're going to feed the content out and that will do the social for you as far as the learner communication. Yep. But on the process side, you know, we do, um, you, we do, it is a collaborative platform. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Well, and I think that's right. And, and it can be a little bit tough. I think that's one of the, the murky areas for people who first start treading into this territory of tech is understanding how does this change what we're doing. And again, there's some time that you have to take to figure out and take the time to map it. I like the idea of saying, Hey, try this, try this with a group of people so they can pressure test and say, Hey, this is, this is how we design. This is how it's going to shift. This is what changes. This is what doesn't, this is what works. This is what doesn't so that you can work out those kinks. So instead of again, stroke of the pen, Hey, everybody, we've got this thing. You all have to do this. You're, you're, I've seen it. You end up with an LCM mass. I like that. That's true. It's, right. Yep. You end up with, <laughs> you end up with a hot mess because everybody's out just doing whatever they want. And you end up with just 
and LCMS. So there you go. There's another term that you can I, that I, we might we might use that one internally. <laughs> 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 LCMS. We try to avoid those. Like I said, we found that it's just more time and energy. Um, if somebody comes with us and they want to start big, it might sound weird, but we say don't spend all that no. money. You know, no. buy small. Hold on to it. Let's get it right. Small and grow the account. Then you start with a big account that's just going to churn. Everybody just ends up unhappy at that point. Yeah, it's not a yep. win. Awesome. Well, this has been fantastic, Leslie. I appreciate you making the time. I know we've been we've been working to make this one work for a bit. So this is yep. fantastic. I enjoyed the conversation. Hopefully, everybody else enjoyed it. The live replay and recording will be available if you missed part of it. But thank you for being here. I hope you, you have a wonderful rest of your Friday and a fantastic weekend. Thanks, everybody. And we'll see you, you next everyone. week.